information for you. So don't feel bad because this is the 21st century and uh, I am, uh, believe it or not, though I might look young, I'm a dying breed. Um, the next generation of scholars, I'm sure, won't be doing their research by reading books. Hopefully all the crap that I'm putting out in cyberspace, there's some sense to be made of this and somebody who can start doing research based on just video content. That'd be cool. Right? Maybe we can advance a little bit. So it's not to feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm so smart because I read books. I, I look at myself as the last of a dying breed because the next generation, and if not this next generation, the generation after, you know, we're still doing research reading books? Well, maybe, you know, maybe we are, but it's so much quicker to get it this way. The thing is, though, you have to take my word for it. But you can always read the text uh, to, to check, right? So knowledge has been lost. Let's try and get access to it. It doesn't have to be this conspiracy theory spooky way of getting access to it. Just read a book, right? It's in the book. <laughs> you know, step your language game up. Go to the place that you're learning your language and start translating stuff yourself, right? That's how that's how you get to it. Um, next point: both left and right, um, uh, uh, both left and right occultists are not debating the importance and influence of science. They're not saying left left hand occultists. Um, Right-hand path occultists, they're not saying that science is fake, right? No, no occultists are saying that. I say, no, science is legitimate. Scientists know what they're talking about. However, um, they're saying that it's not the only way to solve um, and access the truths of the universe, right? So they both, both left and right, believe in alternative methods of accessing the truth. Right, so both uh, left-hand path occultists and right-hand path occultists believe that there are uh, different ways of accessing the truth, and, and science is just one method of accessing the truth. And the reason why I'm presenting the information in that sense is because I believe that's true. Right, it can't just be science, especially if you're a theist. Right, if you're a theist and you know you think that occultism is what's dangerous to your theistic belief, then you're completely misinformed. The most dangerous thing to your theistic belief is science. Occultism is the last thing you need to fear because you and the occultists share something in common, and it's the foundational account you share in common, the most important thing you share in common, right? So if you're really scared of anything, don't be scared of the occult, be scared of science, right? So, and that's just a fact. Um, next thing, both the left hand and the right hand occultists, and here's a very important thing, right? Both the left hand and right hand occultists believe that sexual reproduction, this is very, very important, sexual reproduction is the source of death. Sexual reproduction is the source of death. Death is inherent in who we are. We are, to use the Heideggerian term, beings toward death. Right? Heidegger, and I've given footnotes um, to Heidegger, in Heidegger's Being in Time, Heidegger talks about this notion of being towards death. I'm not going to do a Heideggerian analysis of being towards death right now. I'll give you a, a two-minute crash course on being towards death. The, the wrong way of looking at death, right? And I'm, now that I think about it, I might do a series on the philosophy of death because the best, one of the best classes I ever took um, with uh, George Kovacs was um, a whole discourse on the philosophy of death. It was probably the, my top two best, top three best courses I've ever had, right? So the... The misnomer is to think that here I am, and here is death. So that death is this external force, and then death comes and encroaches upon me, and as a result, I die, right? So that were it not for this external force, I'd still be alive, but first, you know, death is an external force, and death sort of dropped in on me and killed me. And, and Heidegger says that this is wrong, right? And Heidegger's absolutely right. Heidegger says that we are beings toward death, right? So that death... Death is, um, and this is where we get this internal, external. Death, death is both that which is outside and that which is within. We are beings that are inherently um, going to die from the moment that we're born. It's not like we're, we're living, we're living, we're living, and then we start a, a, the passage of dying. It's sort of a pessimistic view, but the second that you're born, you begin dying. That clock ticks down. Right? You begin dying the second that you're born. Death is inside of us, right? We are, death is who we are. Uh, and the way that you can justify this in, in, um, in a scientific, if you want scientific justification, now is definitely not the, the lecture to be doing scientific justification, but if you want a scientific justification for this, look at the distinction between sexual and asexual reproduction. Oh, actually, right up here. So we have asexual, and then we have sexual, right? We recognize that with asexual, what ends up happening is it's just um, one organism, right? Uh, splits itself and creates two organisms, 
and they're both the same as the progeny or identical clones of the original um, lineage, right? So let's say we're talking about some form of bacterial strain, whatever, um, let's say I'm using uh, amoxicillin, if you will, to kill this particular strain. If it kills the, the lineage, it'll kill, if it kills the parent, it'll kill the offspring because they're identically the same, right? What happens in, asexual, uh, in sexual reproduction is, and not only that, but the important thing is, is that this is exactly the same, so in a sense, like, immortality has been preserved here, right, in sort of a, an ontological sense. It is the same organism, right? This organism is exactly the same. I, it's like I've sort of split myself, like, multiplicity or something, right? I've split myself down the middle, and now there's two Dr. Campbells, and then I split myself, and then they become four. We're all the same. In a sense, I've immortalized myself in my progeny. I am my progeny, right, because I've divided myself asexually. What happens in sexual reproduction is that we have two different, two different organisms and they produce a new organism. This new organism is different, right? So one of the advantages that you get from sexual reproduction is diversity and um, resilience within the community, blah, 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 blah. One of the disadvantages, if you want to look at it that way, is death, right? We're going to die, right? I'm going to end up dying. There's no immortality for me. Um, uh, this is scientific view. There's no immortality for me as there is in this concept of asexual reproduction. When I die, I die. There is no me dividing myself on forever, right? So that we recognize that we are beings toward death, right? So what Heidegger, is, Heidegger doesn't talk about all this sexual, asexual stuff. That's just sort of background stuff. What Heidegger is saying is that you can't look at death as like an assailant, like a robber breaking into your house, holding a gun to you and killing you. Whether the robber broke into your house and killed you, whether you died in a fire, whether you were hit by a bus, whether you had cardiac arrest or died because of cancer, you're going to die, right? So don't think that even if you get hit by a bus or someone shoots you or kills you, you get stabbed to death or whatever, you die in an act of genocide, that you would have lived forever. No, you're going to die, right? We're all going to die. Um, you can pray for a happy death, right? As Camus would say, right? You can pray for a happy death. But typically what's going to end up happening is we're all going to die. Um, what ends up happening is we recognize that it's not this external threat that comes out and kills us. My battery died. Um, so the, the one thing, well, before I get to that, because I'm not sure where it, it stopped. So both the, the um, followers of the left-hand path of the occult and the right-hand path of the occult, the quote-unquote bad side and the good side of the occult, believe that we are being towards death, that Death isn't something that comes as an external threat to us and kills us, that death is inherent in who we are. And then the last thing that they both ascribe to, and there's probably many more things, but, you know, um, I wanted to, I wanted to um, fit it on a page is really what I wanted to do. Um, the, the, the last thing that they wanted um, to do is, uh, not wanted to do, the last thing that they agree on, um, and I'm not claiming that this is exhaustive, is the idea of the one, right? They, they believe that there is a one essential seminal force, right? And this, obviously, seminal force is a divine force. And it, this is the uncaused cause, right? This is the uncaused cause. This is God. This is whatever name you want to give it, right? Um, Satan, Satanists might have a different name for it. Um, um, believers might have a different name for this. Right-hand path uh, occultists might have a different name. But they all agree that there is this one primordial um, divine force. Which is not to say that there aren't demigods and minor deities and demons and witches and so on and so forth. But there is this one ultimate force. Um, again, this is nothing... It, it, I'm sure this is new to a lot of people because there hasn't been a, a clear exposition on this that I've seen um, really ever. It's always been, you know, Satanists worship the devil. Um, but you'll see that this idea... Um, really runs through history, and a lot of people have written on this, and I've, I've cited quite a bit of, I've cited quite a bit of people in um, in the notes. But the person that I think is most indebted to this idea, the person that's most indebted to this idea is Parmenides, and in Plato's Parmenides, again, as I said, um, I did my my um, my master's degree, I completed in 05, and I did it on um, um, antiquity. And at the time, I'm not any, I'm not good anymore. I haven't read um, uh, ancient Greek texts in a while. I'm, I, I can still sort of make stuff out. I can sound it out in the words I'm sort of good with. But you know, if you don't practice, you get rusty. You lose your skills. Um, but I was at the time reading um, text in ancient Greek and slowly going through translations and such. And with respect to this idea of the one, 
in Parmenides, 